That's what it means to walk by faith. It's taking God at His word and then acting upon it. Good morning, beloved. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here this morning. The young ones are headed off to uh, Children's Church, and I would encourage you, please, to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The earlier parts of this letter have pointed out the disastrous results of unbelief. In this chapter, Chapter 11, the writer is going to emphasize the tremendous blessings and benefits of genuine belief, of true faith. Hebrews 10, uh, you remember, as we looked at, received, we got some assurances and some warnings, assurances that our faith in Christ is real and the blessings that arise from that, and we also some warnings not to neglect responding properly to faith in Christ and to what Jesus Christ has done for us. And there's some warnings there that if we neglect that, then there's no other hope for us. In chapter 11, though, we're going to be looking at the idea of faith, what faith is all about. In chapter 12, we'll think about the word hope and how Having faith in Christ provides hope for us even in the days in which we live. And then in chapter 13, we're going to be thinking about how to live in these days, the practical aspects of it. What does it look like as, it's lived, as our faith is lived out each and every day? But in chapter 11, we want to think about what faith is and some examples of faith. If I were to ask you to give me a definition or if I were to ask people out on the street to give me a definition, what do you think faith is? Some of them would say, well, it's, it's kind of like a blind leap in the dark. You don't know what's out there, but you, you hope for something good. And you just 
step out and give God a try or something. Is that really biblical faith? I don't think so. Faith is defined for us here in Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look at that and see what all is there, but it's, it's so much more than some kind of a blind leap in the dark. Maybe you've heard somebody say, well, I have faith. I just believe, and I, I, I have faith in faith. I just believe. Well, that's not really biblical faith either. Because biblical faith is always focused on an object, or more particularly, a person. And the faith that we have, the belief that we express, is only as good as the object of our faith. So this morning, as we begin in Hebrews chapter 1, I want us to be thinking about faith. And I want you to be thinking about your faith. Is it a biblical faith? Or is it just sort of a hope so, I guess so, kind of blind leap in the dark? Because it doesn't have to be that. God has given us ample foundation upon which to focus our faith. So let's pray and ask God to open his word to us. Father, this is your word, and I pray that you will take your word, and through your spirit you will open our hearts and our minds, that we might understand your word, that we might evaluate ourselves in light of your word, and Lord, if we need to change, if we need to come to you on your terms and not on our terms, then I pray, Father, that we would have the strength and the grace to be able to do that. If we are trusting in you according to biblical faith, then, Father, help us to rejoice in that and to be even more confident and more firm in that so that we might grow in our faith. Father, teach us now by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, faith is, well, when you ever, whenever you see that, you ought to circle it because you're going to have a, a firm definition. You know, there's some other places, God is, and it tells us what God is and, and gives us descriptions of God, so you ought to circle these things because these are foundational truths for us. Faith is is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I hope that two words jump out at you as you read that verse, and they are substance and evidence. Because both of those words speak of realities, don't they? Substance. Something that's, that's real, something that that is tangible, something that you can look at and be convinced of. And the word evidence, the word evidence speaks of things that are persuasive, things that, that really lock down the truth. It's evidence, something that might be admissible, for example, in a court of law to either prove or disprove a charge against someone. We look for evidence, and that's what God has provided. Faith is the substance. That word only appears five times in the New Testament, and three of those occurrences are right here in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 1, verse 3, we read this. It's talking about Jesus, who being the, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, you say, wait a minute, person, that doesn't sound like substance. Well, hang on. Some translations use the express image of his nature or his essence or his being. I think it's the New Living Translation says that he is the very character of God. The translators are trying to get to the bottom of this word in the Greek language that we often express as, uh, as or substance. In chapter 3, verse 14, they're still trying to do this. 
It says we've become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. There the same word is translated as confidence. Some translations say the reality, the assurance, or the initial confidence. Chapter 11 verse 1 says substance. Some translations use assurance or reality or confidence. This word in Greek, hypostasis, means the very foundation and bedrock of something upon which everything else is built. It doesn't have a single word concept in English. That's why our English translators are struggling and why they, they emphasize a different shade of meaning in different particular verses because of the context of the verse. What they're trying to get to is that faith is the bedrock, the solid foundation, the substance, the essence upon which everything else is built. So faith is pretty important, isn't it? It's not just a wish. It's not just a hope. It's not just a preference. It goes much, much, much deeper than that. It is the very core upon which everything else is built. The word, subst or the word um, evidence. The word evidence is also unique in Scripture. This is the only place that it appears. So if we compare it with how the word was used in secular Greek, in, in the, the, the Greek that was spoken and written in the same time as, as Jesus, we discover that it's used in a court of law. And it stands for the persuasive argument or the persuasive stuff that's brought to a court to prove either innocence or guilt. If you've ever been to a court proceeding, you know that the, the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney bring their evidences. The prosecuting attorney often brings some hard evidence. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's the gun, maybe it's the knife with the fingerprints of the accused on it, but they bring hard evidence that is intended to be persuasive that what is being claimed is reality. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the truth. We're looking for reality. So, has God provided any substance, any evidence that we can found our faith upon? Oh, yes, indeed he has. God never asks us to take a blind leap in the dark. God never asks us to just sort of hope so that everything's going to maybe sort of somehow turn out okay. No, God has given us very, very clear evidence, very substantive things. I could ask you to simply look at your own hand. It's part of God's creation. And all of the bones, all of the ligaments, all of the joints that are there, the way it moves, and how the thumb is opposed to the other fingers, that's how you can hold something. You know, evolutionists want us to ascend from monkeys. They don't have an opposable thumb. They, they don't hold things like we do. And, and just something that simple is an evidence of design, of purpose, of creation. If there is a design, there must of necessity be a designer. You can't have design, you can't have purpose without something behind the scenes making the design, giving the purpose. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glories of God. You go out and look up in the night sky and what at first view looks like just random stuff we realize now is not random at all. This earth is moving around inside 
of a gigantic celestial clock. Those constellations that are out there, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of those things function in predictable ways, and we can know that as the earth moves around the sun and the, our view of the various stars and constellations change, and yet it's going to be the same year after year after year. And Genesis says that God put the sun and the moon and the stars in place to serve as markers for times and for seasons and for years. And guess what? That's exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. What God's Word says is demonstrated in reality. And all of that then becomes the foundation. It becomes the, the, the very core of faith. We're not asked to believe in something that nobody knows whether or not it exists. While we can't put God in a test tube or on a microscope slide and, and test Him and see Him, the evidence of Him is all over the place. Faith is the substance, it's the ground upon which we hope for things because we see God and we know Him and, and we know His character and we, we lock into that. It is the evidence of things not seen. Jump down with me to verse 6. This is amazing. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Well, we have lots of evidence for God's existence. God, in fact, revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He says, I am. That's his personal name. And what it means is, I'm the existing one. The self-existent, eternal existence. Does that make sense? <laughs> In other words, if God didn't exist, nothing else would exist. Because He is the one who has brought everything into existence, obviously except Himself. He is life. He is existence. He is reality. And therefore, everything else that does exist exists because God has brought it into being. If you start with nothing, you have nothing. That, that whole business of existence baffles scientists today. They have to decide, okay, then, then maybe... Maybe it's the matter of the universe that's eternal. Maybe that's what has always existed. But that's not true. Because we see that the matter of the universe is all decaying. No, we need, we need to have something. There needs to be something that is self-existent, that's not decaying, that's, that's not generated by something else, but is in fact its own existence and that it needs to be a sustainable existence one that doesn't decay or rot or break down and that beloved is God his very name I am tells us who he is if you look at Exodus chapter, or not Exodus, Hebrews chapter 6. You first must believe that he exists, that he is, and secondly, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's faith in action. Faith in theory says, yes, I believe God exists. Faith in action says, I'm going to look for him. I believe he's there. I'm going to look for him. And God has revealed himself in creation, and so we don't have to look very far. 
And when we are looking for God, when we are seeking Him, God delights in revealing Himself to us. It's just amazing what God's Word says. Now this business of faith, if we get back there to verse 2, this business of faith, it says, for by it, by this faith that's rooted and grounded in substance and evidence, this faith, by it the elders obtained a good testimony. That's a kind of a challenging word or challenging thing to translate. Literally it says, for by this the elders testified. Some translations say, well, they gained God's approval by their faith. Well, that, I get it, but that doesn't quite get it. That doesn't quite get to the root of it. Um, some say that they gained a good reputation or earned a good reputation. And they're looking at it from the human perspective and, and the fact that these men and, and women in the Old Testament, because they believed God, because they believed He existed, because they put their faith into practice, it is that putting into practice which becomes their testimony. They're not gaining something from God. They're demonstrating something to the world. You see the difference? They're not gaining something from God with their faith, though they are. I mean, they're gaining a right relationship. But they're, the, the emphasis is that they're demonstrating to the ones looking on the reality of their trust and belief in God. So that's why it says, for example, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And then that's quoted for us several other times in the New Testament. When we have a concept that says God exists and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him, and we've got the theoretical faith down, and then we apply that to the practical faith that we look for God, we have our eyes open, and we seek His will, and we seek His word, and we seek His ways. That's living by faith. We see the evidence of God around us, and we respond to it. That's biblical faith. It's not a leap in the dark. It's rather a coming to an acknowledgement of the God who exists and who's given evidence of His existence and of His desire that we should know Him. Why do you think God has given us this book? So that we should know Him. So that we can put our faith in Him. So that we have a ground a bedrock, a foundation upon which to stand. Notice, let's go on here in verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. There's Genesis. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. In the beginning, God created. And God said, let there be, and it was. That's creation. Were you and I there at creation to observe it? No, we weren't. But we accept the testimony of God who was there, and who was the Creator, and who brought it into being. Now, none of us have ever met George Washington, have we? But we accept the testimony of historians. We accept the testimony of letters that have George Washington's signature at the bottom of them. We, we accept the testimony of others, and therefore we say George Washington existed. He's the father of our country. And he did this and he did that. And we have evidence of that. Well, God is the one who says, in the beginning, God created. 
And we have the evidence of creation and of order and design and all of those things that God built into creation, which includes our own conscience, our own awareness that there's something more than us, and all of that becomes evidence. But let's go a little bit further. This last part of the verse is, is amazing. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Think about that. The material stuff of this universe is made of invisible stuff. You say, my goodness, I can't get my head wrapped around that. Well, let's look at, let's look at uh, the world of science for us. The Greeks came up with a word, it's called the word atom, atmos. And that was the thing, whatever it was in their mind, they, they, they maybe didn't know it all completely, but they said there is something in this universe that is indivisible. Whatever that indivisible thing is, we're going to call that the atmos, the atom. Well, we applied that in modern science to all those little diagrams that you remember from your science book that had the protons, the neutrons in it, and the little electrons spinning around on the outside. We called that the atom. But we split the atom, didn't we? And we came up with the atom bomb. And we came up with nuclear power. We've learned how to split the atom. And we thought, ah, okay, well, you know, that's the end of that story. Protons, neutrons, electrons. But we kept learning. And we've discovered that those protons and neutrons are made up of things called quarks. And you can't see them. You can't see the protons and electrons either. The only thing you can see is the effect that those things have. And so while they're invisible to us, and while they are so small... By the way, the, the nucleus of the atom, which we can't see is about 10,000 times smaller than an atom itself. Those little quarks are about 10,000 times smaller than the protons that they make up and the neutrons that they make up, the neutrinos and all those things. I mean, we're talking really small. I mean really, really, really small. And who knows whether those quarks are in turn made up of something. It's all invisible. And it's all so small that you think, my goodness, how would it ever make any impact? How would we ever get something solid like your body and mine out of things that are invisible? Well, that's not too hard for God. God can do that. You want a practical example of things that are invisible and yet they're very real? Think about radio waves. You know, you go out in the car and you turn on your radio and you, you hear the sound that's coming over that spectrum of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which encompasses light and radio waves and all those things, and, and, and they're passing through your body. How is that possible? Well, if most of it's made up of quarks and neutrinos and protons and neutrons and electrons and things that are so small that we can't even see them, it's not hard at all. Now the Bible is not a textbook on science, but when the Bible speaks about the physical universe, it's absolutely accurate. This universe is made up of things that are invisible. And yet, we have a visible universe. Wow. Think about the spectrum of light for just a moment. We can see those seven colors. Roy G. Biv. You remember that from science? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. It's the rainbow colors. But that's not all the visible light. There's, there's ultraviolet light. There's infrared light. There's gamma light. Radiation, radiation is a form of light. It's all part of that electromagnetic spectrum. We can't see those things. But if our eyes were adjusted so that we could see them, this whole universe, 
most of which appears dark and black to us, would be absolutely ablaze with light. It's just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. God made these things, the things that are visible, out of the things which are invisible. What an incredible being God is. What an incredible God. Goes way beyond what you and I can begin to imagine. And it is that God that has revealed himself in creation, that has revealed himself in his word, that has revealed himself in his interaction with human beings. For example, verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen. Nobody had ever seen a raindrop. They had never seen a rainstorm. They had never seen a flood. They had never seen those things because that was not part of God's original creation. But by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved, he acted, he did something moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned. All of that, beloved, is pre-flood. How is it that Abel and Enoch and Noah, and surely others in their generation, how is it that they knew God and pleased God? It was by faith. They considered what God had done. They considered what God had revealed and they took God at his word, and they acted upon it. So how were they made in a right relationship with God even before the flood? By faith. How about after the flood and before the cross? Well, let's take a look at that. Verse um, 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He didn't have to know the where because he already knew the who. He knew who called him. This incredible God who had created the universe and who had given incredible testimony of his existence. That God called Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to take you and give you a land that you don't know anything about yet. Come on, let's go on a walk. And Abraham got up and went on a walk. Did he do it perfectly? No, he didn't do it perfectly. Sometimes he got it right. Sometimes he messed up. But he never got his eyes off God. And he learned to walk by faith. Time would fail me if we looked at everything else. We're going to look at a few, and that's just the way it is. By faith, Sarah. By the way, this faith business isn't just for the guys. It's for the girls, too. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed when she bore and bore a child when she was past the age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, if you read the account in Genesis... She kind of sniggered a little bit and, you know, <clears throat> yeah, really, right? But she believed. Do you always believe everything absolutely correctly the first time you hear from God? Probably not. <laughs> we all struggle a little bit. We stumble a little bit. We see it in God's Word and we think, hmm, I don't know if that applies to me or not. I'm sure Sarah was probably no different than any of us. But she believed God. She didn't get stuck in the how because she knew the who. She knew who had said it. And she knew that he was faithful and trustworthy. And we could keep on going. I mean, there's Jacob and there's Isaac and, and, and all through here. And, and, and none of them, none of them got it right always 
but they nevertheless acted consistently with what they knew and they understood. And God worked with them. That's the amazing thing. The Old Testament shows us a God who is willing to work with fallen creatures like you and me. And so does the New Testament. Jesus comes, very incarnation of God, God in the flesh, and He comes and He works with people, doesn't He? He works with Peter, and He works with John, and He works with Thomas, and all of these imperfect people He works with, and He, he reveals Himself he explains the pages of the Old Testament. He reveals himself to them. He performs miracles in front of them to give them assurance of who he is and what he is claiming. And these guys recognize who he is. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. God in the flesh. And they put their faith in him. Not in some blind, ethereal hope. But they put their faith in a person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what the Old Testament saints were doing. They were putting their faith in God. In a person. In a real, honest-to-goodness being whether it was before the flood or after the flood and before the cross or whether it's after the cross, our faith is focused on a real person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the second person of the Trinity who stepped out of heaven and into a human body, into flesh, and grew up and experienced life and was tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. Does this sound a little bit like what we've looked at in Hebrews so far? All of it is pointing to this, this focus of our faith that it's not on blind hope and a wishful thought. It's on Jesus, whom we will identify in chapter 12, you're working on it, as the author and the finisher of our faith. This is absolutely amazing. Notice what happens. I'm going to ask you to jump down, because I, I know we're, we're over time here, but we'll get over it. Verse 30, by, the walls, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. They were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who believed when she received the spies in peace. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and in Barak, of Samson and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, and the next word is a verb, isn't it? It's an action who through faith took action. Through faith, they took action. They subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Boy, those are great victories, aren't they? I mean, we want to be a part of that company. Wouldn't you like to be able to vanquish an army? To do great exploits? Those are great victories. And they were brought about by faith, by men and women who believed what God said and acted upon it. They were not passive. They did not sit there. God said something to them and they acted upon it. God revealed something to them, and it changed their lives. There was belief combined with action. That is genuine faith. It's rooted and grounded in substance and evidence. 
and it produces results. Those were great, great victories. I want us to look at some even greater victories. Others, middle of verse 35, were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Joel Osteen wasn't among them. You know, this, this business about God's got your best life here and you can have your best life and if you believe in God, everything's going to be sweet and lovely and you're going to prosper. And it, it is a false gospel. It is trash. It is blasphemy. Don't get stuck in that. These are greater victories. You say, Pastor, how in the world could these be greater victories? Because their eternal reward is greater because they believed even unto death. Oh, believe me, if I had the choice between winning a battle and dying in a battle, I'd rather win the battle and go home and, you know, go on to another day. But if I'm willing to enter into the battle and to die in the battle and to receive the greater resurrection in the future, that's okay too. That's okay too. Beloved, the description here, this is, this is not a failure on God's part. It's not like, well, you know, the, the first half, he was, God was there and he delivered him and all that stuff, and then, well, then, you know, God got tired and he ran out of power and so the, all the others were mocked and, you know, no, 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 that's not it. God was just as real and just as powerful and just as strong when, when Isaiah, perhaps, was, is the reference here, the one sawn in two. There's a strong tradition that King Manasseh, after his father died, got sick and tired of Isaiah and had him cut in half. <sighs> that's a grisly thought, isn't it? So maybe, you know, did God fail Isaiah? No, not at all. Isaiah's reward is going to be far greater because Isaiah's faith was firm even in the face of death. And Isaiah's faith was firm. And these others went to their deaths. Why? Because they had an eternal perspective they did not love their lives in this life so much that they were unwilling to give it up. They loved life in eternity in God's presence so much that they were willing to give up this life. That was their faith. They knew the character of God. They considered the revelation of God of Himself to mankind. They had faith. They were grounded on that substance and that evidence. And it was bedrock firm. And so they acted upon it. Which in these cases meant they left this world and went to be with God. Notice then in verse 38, we understand now why this verse is here. Of whom the world was not worthy. You, you think, wouldn't you, that those folks that are going about in sheepskins and goatskins and they're destitute and they're afflicted and they're tormented, you'd think that they'd be the scum of the earth, that they, would, they wouldn't be anything worthwhile at all. <laughs> oh no, no. They were worth far more than the world. The world wasn't worthy of them. Because their hearts, their minds, their eyes were fixed on Christ. They were fixed on eternity. And they were willing to leave this world behind. And all these, verse 39, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. We might be able to say 
in this life. And really, it's not about this life, is it? We all know that this life is coming to an end. We're here for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, 100 years, 10, 12, 5. We're here for just a short period of time. But there's no end to eternity. There's no end to eternal life. The only question is, where will you spend that eternal life? Will you spend it in heaven with God, in the new heavens and new earth, enjoying God's presence forever? Or will you spend it in the eternal lake of fire, separated from God, suffering because of your rejection of Him? What's your choice? Where will you spend eternity? Those who walk by faith have eternity in view and they live according to God's standard and the values of eternity. They see that this life is here for a moment and gone. And so this life is not something to be held on to at all costs. This life is something we're all going to have to let go of. So when that moment comes to let go of this life, let's do it in a way that honors God. Let's do it in a way that demonstrates our faith. Whether we die as a martyr or whether we die of old age, let our minds, let our hearts, let our whole being be focused on Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's what it means to walk by faith. It's taking God at His word and then acting upon it. That's why in James chapter 2, and we're not going to look there, you can read it later, James says faith without works is dead. He says you have faith and you don't have any works? I'll show you my faith by what I do. He's not talking about earning your way to salvation. He's not talking about good works in order to get to heaven because that's a fool's errand. You can't do it. But if you know Christ as your Savior, if you are trusting in Him, if you are taking God at His word, your life will begin to conform to that and you will have the evidence, the fruit of works, good works, works of faith in your life as evidence of the reality of your belief in God. Beloved, maybe you're here today and you have been mystified by this business of faith and you've always thought it was just sort of a blind hope so in something that you couldn't really see. I, I hope that you begin to understand that God has given ample evidence of his reality. And though we can't put him under a microscope, and though we can't put him in a test tube and run tests on him like a scientist, he's there, he's real nevertheless. Your very body and its functioning is evidence of God and his existence. And I hope that you're coming to the place where you're going to be able to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not a blind leap in the dark. It's a decision to act upon what God has revealed about himself, that substance, that evidence, that solid foundation that God has revealed to us, and we say, God, I'm going to stand there. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you no matter what. If you've never come to that place in your relationship with God today, I, I would encourage you to make that decision to take that step, to exercise that kind of faith that is a faith born of confidence in the character of Almighty God. And you'll be surprised at what God does in your life. You'll be amazed. He will begin to work and to change and to show you himself and, and reveal his word to you. And you will be like these ones that are mentioned here, whether we, whether we live or whether we die in faith, 
will be like these that are described in Hebrews, the ones who through faith received a kingdom, received eternal life. And if you're here this morning and you know God and there's no question about that in your mind, I want you to understand that that you've got solid evidence. You've got substance. You've got something to build your life on. And I want to encourage you to keep growing. Keep building that life. Keep trusting God. That sounds like Hebrews, doesn't it? Keep trusting. Don't turn back. Persevere. Keep going. Because Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers is real. It's available to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We've, I didn't even scratch the surface this morning. Lord, there was so much more to be said and the time is gone. But Father, I pray that the things that have been said are the things that were most needful and that your spirit will take your word And that you will drill these things down into our lives and that you will change us from the very inside out. Father, help us to live by faith, to make each decision of each day, whatever it is that we're going to do, to make it in light of eternity, to make it in light of your word. So that, Father, when we get to the end of our lives, whether it's through just old age and natural causes or some uh, some sudden entrance into your presence whatever that might be that father in any case will hear you say well done good and faithful servant help us father to be faithful we pray these things in jesus precious name and for his glory amen